Thank you. Thank you for the invitation uh, to this nice workshop. Unfortunately, I can only be here today due to teaching constraints. Um, but I wish I could have been for the whole, the whole time. So I'm going to talk about um, some convergence theory for stochastic gradient descent with adaptive learning rate or adaptive step size update. Um, we'll be focusing here on a variant of a, a pretty often used uh, update strategy in, in practice for training neural networks, and, and that's called Adagrad. Um, I want to thank uh, my student, Zhao Jia Wu, who did a lot of this work and moved this along a lot faster than uh, I could have without her. So she helped a lot. So what is this talk about? Um, I thought that Jorge Nosedal summed up a good motivation for, for thinking about these sorts of problems better than I could. Uh, I guess he said in 2012 that we want to design methods for machine learning that maybe aren't as ideal as Newton's method but have certain properties. They turn towards the right directions and they have the right length, i.e. the step size of one is going to be working most of the time. Um, that's really nice. Right now, we are still quite far from this, this dream uh, in theory and practice. A lot of the theory for stochastic gradient descent and its variants hinge on the, the step size or the step size schedule being chosen uh, in a price, precise way to depend on properties of optimization problem that we don't actually know um, in advance. So that's sort of theoretical, whereas in practice, the step size schedule or step size is often chosen by brute force search or some combination of search and uh, intuition. So there's a disconnect there. So I'll quickly just go through gradient descent, fixed step size, um, the basic gradient descent algorithm with a, with a fixed step size or learning rate. Um, you know, if the learning, if the step size is chosen just right, then gradient descent has, has very nice theoretical convergence properties. Um, in particular, for if the function we're minimizing is, is smooth, even better if it's smooth and convex, uh, et cetera. What people don't often emphasize is that this is quite brittle uh, with respect to the choice of the fixed step size. If the step size eta is chosen to be too big, then this algorithm can diverge, oscillate or diverge, even if it's just chosen too big by a little bit. And if it's chosen to be too small for the problem, then the convergence is much slower than we would like it to be. Um, so in the simple case, when we're just looking at gradient descent theory with a fixed step size, um, when we're trying to optimize a function that is smooth, it has, uh, then, then the theory is very, very classic, very easy, very straightforward. Um, and that's a setting we'll talk about mostly in this talk. So if the function f we want to optimize, um, if it's, it has a gradient, and its gradient is uh, L Lipschitz, in the sense um, that there's this maximum number L, such that the norm of the gradient can't change too quickly as we move from a point x, or the gradient can't change too much when we move from x to y, is essentially the curvature, the maximum curvature of the, of the function. Uh, then that number L really is the, the parameter that, that tells us how to choose the fixed step size in theory. Uh, the classic theory uh, says that if we, uh, for gradient descent with fixed step size eta, and if F is all smooth, then if we choose eta to be a number less than or equal to this critical one over L value, then we have sort of one over T uh, convergence to a stationary point of the function. Um, particular after on the order of one over eta times epsilon iterations of gradient descent, we reach a point x sub t where the norm of the gradient squared is less than or equal to epsilon. On the other hand, uh, so this one over L is the step size we want in theory. On the other hand, if the step size is chosen just a little too big, just by a factor of two, if it's greater than two over L, then gradient descent can oscillate or diverge. Okay. Now, in practice, this is, this is sort of a theoretical problem I'm talking about, because in practice, if you're running gradient descent, you're not going to use fixed step size. Uh, it's much better to just choose a step size that's adaptively chosen at each iteration by, say, a backtracking line search. And this is, line search is, has theoretical justification. It works very well, and this is what people do in practice if you're going to implement gradient descent. So the question of the step size and gradient descent is sort of a theoretical 
uh, question, not so um, important in practice. But if we move to stochastic gradient descent, which is the algorithm uh, used uh, in large-scale machine learning problems, then um, line search does not work, and we really are at um, you know, point zero with choosing the step size. So I want to focus on stochastic gradient descent, where instead of moving in the direction of the negative gradient of the loss function in each iteration, we move in a direction that's a random variable, which is just in expectation going to be in the, the direction of the, full, of the full gradient. OK? So stochastic gradient descent is a stochastic algorithm. As in the gradient, the deterministic or batch gradient descent setting, um, if we consider stochastic gradient descent with a fixed step size, then we don't want that fixed step size to be too small, or it will converge too slowly. We don't want the step size to be too big, or it won't converge. So that, that analogy uh, uh, holds. But unlike the batch deterministic gradient descent setting, the solution is not to do um, a line search uh, at each iteration to sort of solve for the best step size um, um, greedily at that, at that point. And um, I guess one explanation for this is we don't want to overfit um, the, op the, the, the algorithm to a direction of descent that's already not exactly the correct direction. It's a random direction that's only correct in expectation, so we don't want to overfit to something that's not so precise. Another way of, of thinking about why line search doesn't work is that in stochastic gradient descent, really the choice of step size has to balance uh, this smoothness parameter L, as with gradient descent. And also, it also depends on how noisy the, the, the stochastic gradients are. Um, the smaller the amount of noise, uh, the more stochastic gradient descent acts like gradient descent. As the noise level increases, it behaves very differently. Does anyone have any questions? You know, all, you, know all, you know all this. OK, so let's just state sort of the state of the art theory for convergence of stochastic gradient descent. Again, the setting of uh, trying to minimize a smooth function. Not necessarily convex. I'm not talking about convexity here. Just L smooth. Gaudimi and Lan in 2013 um, proved this um, seminal result if the, 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 the function f is L smooth. If we also assume that the variance of the stochastic noise is uniformly bounded by sigma squared, which is a little bit unrealistic. It's sort of um, in the sense that it's, you know, this assumption sort of says we can't consider strongly convex functions, which are, must be um, unbounded, and hence the variance also becomes unbounded. But this is what we have to have. Then. There's a good choice of fixed step size. If we fix the number of iterations t and then pick a fixed step size for stochastic gradient descent, that's equal to eta equal to the minimum of 1 over L. Again, the 1 over L comes up, the smoothness parameter, or also 1 over sigma times square root of t. So the minimum of those two, uh, those two numbers. Then with high probability after t iterations of stochastic gradient descent, we'll reach um, a near uh, stationary point of the function, and we converge to that stationary point at a rate um, that has two terms, a 1 over t term and then a 1 over square root of t uh, term. So when the variance of the stochastic noise is very small and we're close to being in the batch or the deterministic gradient setting, then essentially the first term dominates and we converge at a 1 over t rate like gradient descent. Um, but as the variance gets larger, the variance of the noise gets larger, the, the, the second term will generally take over, and we have a 1 over square root of t convergence rate. Um, OK, so this is a nice theoretical result. But in practice, these parameters L and sigma are not known a priori. So how does this theorem inform us about how to choose a step size in practice if we're doing stochastic gradient descent in practice? Question. Yeah. Um, is this basically just similar to, you know, big lots of the stochastic estimates and average them? Because it's like 1 over sigma or whatever, so. And, the, and then you sort of reduce. 
Are you, are you saying that when you choose larger batches that the sigma should become smaller? Right, yeah, basically you're just averaging out the batches to reduce the sigma. Yes, yes, so what you're saying, Sanjeev, is that um, I'm not talking about it so much, but if you use a larger batch size for stochastic gradient descent, then essentially you're reducing the variance sigma, and this, this gives an idea of how much faster you can converge if you use larger, uh, larger batches in stochastic gradient descent. So I could write this in terms of a parameter being the batch size, but... Oh, goodness. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> that is, I was hoping no one would ask that. I mean, that's, I think, a pretty controversial question. Why to add noise? I'll, well, let, let me yeah, ask OK. Question. Why don't you just uh, do the line search, which you know what you're doing, get to the minimum, and then have another algorithm which, that lets you jump around to see That's a good question. That's a good. That's a good idea. I'll just say, sort of, um, a, a very um, politically um, like okay uh, answer, which is often you're working on with data sets that are so big, so massive that you cannot even do gradient descent because computing a single full gradient of your loss function is too expensive. So gradient descent's not even a possibility. You have to do stochastic gradient descent. You can only compute gradients of um, um, a small number, a component function if your loss function is written as an average over component so function. That, that is the reason that's a reason. Noise. Yes, that's a reason where, yes, yes. Now, you, the other thing you said is another reason people say they'll introduce noise, to make generalization better, to get to a, a better minimizer. But I don't want to talk about that. But independently, for computational reasons, sometimes you can't do gradient descent. Okay, so this is the sort of convergence theory we want to try to match using a method that adaptively updates the step size and does not have to know L or sigma in advance. We want just a very um, non-hyper, uh, an algorithm that does not require these two hyperparameters for a theoretical a convergence rate of this form. That's sort of where we're where we're going with this talk. Okay, so that's in theory. In practice, when people implement stochastic gradient descent, which is sort of the algorithm behind all of the uh, neural network uh, uh, training algorithms in some sense, is, okay, we're just gonna try several different learning rate schedules, which is um, just piecewise constant decreasing choices of the learning rate or step size. Um, where we run stochastic gradient descent with a starting step size for a fixed number of uh, epochs or um, iterations through the entire, the entire data set. And then after a point where the training or the testing error seems to level out, we're going to drop the step size by a certain amount and repeat and repeat. And this is, um, you know, it's, it's, it, this sort of piecewise constant decaying step size schedule is um, justified theoretically, but the exact values of the, the, um, the step size, again, is something hard to, to know a priori. And I want to emphasize that this, this process of training takes a lot of... Exponential decay, piecewise constant? Well, for example, if you look here, you see that if you do this theorem of Gaudini and Land, for example, um, it depends on this delta naught, which is where, how far you are from a point when you start. So if you do this for a number of iterations and then you restart with a smaller step size, then you're restarting with a delta naught that's smaller. Perhaps not. Okay, that's, that's perhaps not. I wasn't, um, okay. I, I, see, I see what you're saying. But uh, um, yeah, so... Okay. Yeah, do you, there's no theory you know for this geometric decay of the step size? Not that I know. I mean, it seems kind of strange. This is decaying much faster than the theory suggests. The theory would suggest. The theory is just about number decay. Yes, yes. 
Well, this is a good open question too, actually. Actually, justify, justify these step size decays in practice. Yes? You want the sum of the step sizes to, sure, to diverge, yes. So that, that happens here. It doesn't? Ha, I mean, it ha, you don't know because you stop it after a finite number of iterations, so. But how do you choose the Oh, I don't know. I'm saying this is a heuristic done in practice. There's no, it's not. Theories are not the window when you just want to have your neural network train better and faster than anyone else. Then you just try to find the best schedule. Who cares? It's, and you take and you do this um, for many different T's and many different alphas and many different eta knots. Um, and you, you do this for weeks um, and cost millions of dollars in GPU time because you just want to find the best, the absolute best convergence rate. Um, and then you pick the, pick the schedule that worked the best for your particular uh, problem and publish that, and, um, and it's very powerful. It works very well, but it's very expensive. This sort of pre-processing where you'd optimize hyperparameters is often pushed under the rug, and it's, it's, from a mathematical perspective, it's very ridiculous. Um, now, I'm you know, making things s more simple than they actually are. It's not just stochastic gradient descent that, that are run in practice. Many stabilizing tricks are added on top of the stochastic gradient descent algorithm um, to make the convergence rate uh, more robust to, say, for example, the choice of step size schedule, less fragile. Um, some of these tricks are Adagrad, RMS prop, Adam, batch normalization. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to actually look at, at Adagrad and not as a sort of trick to, to just make things work better, but actually with some theoretical guarantees. We're going to try to understand this not as a trick but as a on-the-fly adaptive learning rate for taking out the requirements of needing to know these hyperparameters a priori. Okay, so Adagrad, the, the, the basic stochastic gradient descent update with Adagrad learning rate, um, in this talk we'll say proceeds like this. Uh, we, instead of just going xj plus one equals xj minus eta times gj, the direction of the stochastic gradient, we're going to divide eta times gj by a parameter, bj plus one, or a variable, bj plus one. And bj is a running mean square of the running, uh, running sum of the squares of the norms of the stochastic gradients we have observed along the way. Okay, so we're dividing, we're normalizing the gradient, uh, the stochastic gradient at the j iteration by the sum of the squares of the norms of all the stochastic gradients we've seen along the way. OK. Uh, so this is clearly going to result in a step size that decays. It cannot ever, the step size cannot in, increase when we have this. If we consider eta over bj plus 1 as the new step size, then it's going to be decreasing and eventually decreasing at a 1 over square root of t rate because it's a uh, sum of squares of norms. Uh, square root, sorry, bj is a, a, a root mean square of the norms. Okay. Um, in particular, so why the root mean square of the stochastic gradient norms? It's not clear, that's the answer. So I can't give you uh, a really uh, good reason. It has some nice properties, it's scale invariant. So, uh, meaning that we're dividing dj by a number that has the same um, units as itself. What's dj? is the vector, which is the stochastic gradient, the, the, the gradient direction. So in expectation, dj is equal to the gradient of f at xj. That's capital G Yes, it's a random variable. Um, so this is a sort of different version of Adagrad than what was originally introduced by uh, Ducci et al. in 2011. They uh, sort of had a coordinate-wise version of Adagrad where they had different BJ parameters for each of the D coordinates of X. And the justification, the motivation there wasn't as um, necessarily a learning rate 
adaptive learning rate update, but more of a way to reparameterize the optimization problem to balance uh, coordinates where certain coordinates might be updated very frequently because the gradient in that coordinate direction might be large uh, or sparse and, and certain other coordinate directions updated very infrequently. Um, so we're sort of separating, taking out the coordinate part of the original Adegrad algorithm and just looking at a norm version which can be viewed as an adaptive single learning rate. More recently, 2017, um, the convergence of this algorithm was analyzed. Levy proved Adegrad convergence uh, in the setting where the loss function is convex. Um, then Leon or Orabona approved a convergence for something close to Adegrad in the setting of smooth, not necessarily convex optimization, but they required that the smoothness parameter L was known to set the learning rate eta, okay? Um, and then we'll uh, give a result for convergence of Adegrad that does not need to know the, uh, any learning rate, any uh, L a priori. Alternatively, I guess I should mention this, there are more popular variations of Adegrad in practice where we don't take the cumulative root mean square of past gradients when we, when we divide by bj, but we just take a root mean square of the past uh, so many gradients. There's a finite memory. Uh, this is like RMS prop, and then Adam is a more sophisticated variant of that. And you can understand why that might be better in practice to only consider uh, a running window of the past so many gradients because you don't want to accumulate this learning rate too quickly. You don't want the, you don't want the step size to decay too quickly. Um, however, those, those alternatives have been shown to, in this same setting that we'll discuss for Adegrad, possibly not converge. There are bad examples. So there's something more difficult going on, like these alternatives might, on average, work better than Adegrad, but in the worst case, not. So that's, that's a, a note. Okay, so I'm just gonna present some theorems. In the case where I set for Adegrad, I set the parameter eta equal to one. The results I mentioned will be more general, but I'm going to set eta equal to one so that if we run stochastic gradient descent with Adegrad, um, there are absolutely no hyperparameters that we set at the beginning, except for B naught, how we initialize our, um, our, our running uh, root mean square uh, thing. So we, set, we have to initialize B naught to a number greater than zero. We don't have any other hyperparameters. Then we just run it. And uh, first, I'm going to look at theory for Adegrad in the setting of batch gradient descent, where there's no noise on the gradients, um, because it's, um, in a certain sense, illustrative of, of, of the situation that happens in the low noise regime. So I hope I don't confuse you. I'm just gonna first say something about this Adegrad uh, in gradient descent. No noise, no noise. So um, in case we're just in the deterministic gradient descent setting, we have a theorem for this gradient descent with adaptive step size update. Uh, it says if our function is L smooth, then we will reach an epsilon approximate stationary point after T steps of gradient descent with this adaptive update. Um, after a number of steps T equal to B naught over epsilon, if and B naught is initialized greater than or equal to L. On the other hand, it will take a number of iterations T on the order of L log L squared over epsilon if B naught is initialized to be less than L. So how do we compare this to gradient descent with fixed step size that I talked about earlier? Um, I forgot to put that, so I'll just tell you. Um, so if we think of one over B naught as being the analog of eta, what this says is that if we initialize one over B naught to be too small, less than one over L, just as in gradient descent, we have one over L times epsilon convergence. We match the convergence rate. It's slower than optimal, but we don't do worse than gradient descent. On the other hand, if we initialize the step size, if we start with one over B naught um, big, much bigger 
than one over L. When gradient descent will diverge or oscillate, it won't do anything, our step size will decrease to the correct value, essentially one over L, and then it will level out and stay there, um, resulting in a convergence rate that is optimal as if we had chosen the optimal choice of the fixed step size up to an additional factor of L log L, which is not too different from a line search. When you do gradient descent with a line search, you sort of in each iteration incur an additional log L uh, number of gradient evaluations because you're doing a binary, um, binary search, uh, yeah. Okay, and the proof of this, it just uses basic, very basic math. There's nothing fancy. Uh, it's just the proof outline is if you initialize the step size too large, then either the step size must decrease to the critical level of one over L uh, because you're accumulating norms of gradients or otherwise you reach uh, epsilon stationary point, the gradient gets small. One of those two things happens. If you accumulate your, if your step size decreases to the correct value, one over L, then by smoothness of the loss function, we use the descent lemma, the Taylor series, um, that means that it will start converging to a stationary point so quickly that the sum of the squared norms of gradients is a convergent sum. And it will converge so quickly that that will cause my BJ parameter to level out at a value not too much smaller, not too much bigger than, than L not bigger than L plus 2L plus uh, the discrepancy, okay? And um, the other key thing that's used often uh, that exploits the fact that we're doing this uh, root mean square of gradient norms is this log equality, which tells us that the sum um, of the squares of the gradient norms divided by the BJ value um, is not going to increase too quickly. It's always controlled by the log of the sum. And this is not some fancy inequality. This is just the integral test that a function over the integral of itself from zero to t integrating that is, the, is log of the function. But if you use a different normalization besides the root mean square, instead of getting this log upper bound, you can get just like a norm or root mean squared norm, which grows very quickly, so that's bad. Okay, so in the stochastic gradient descent case, we have another theorem. So now we have stochastic gradient back. It's more difficult now uh, because we have noise. But what we can prove uh, in the stochastic uh, gradient descent with Adegrad is if our function is L-smooth and if our stochastic gradient has bounded variance by sigma squared, and if our gradients are uniformly bounded in expectation by some number c sub f squared, then we have a similar convergence rate of stochastic gradient descent with Adegrad to the fixed step size stochastic gradient descent um, in the sense that we have a one over t term and a, one, and a one over square root of t term. Um, except now we did not need to know L or sigma to set the algorithm. It's automatic. Um, but we do see that if we compare this, put this above the result of Gaudimi and Lan for stochastic gradient descent with fixed step size, we do lose something. We, um, we have an additional log factor which numerically does not show up, but it, it comes from this log inequality I showed you a few slides back. We also have this dependence on the expect the, um, the CF constant. We have to assume our gradients are uniformly bounded in expectation, whereas they do not. So in particular, as we let sigma go to zero and go into the case of deterministic gradient descent, we do not recover a convergence rate for deterministic gradient descent, um, that is one over T rate, whereas the Gademian land result does. So that's a future direction 
uh, to improve this theory. I think it's very possible. We just don't have the, the analysis. Um, the proof highlights. The proof was very fun for this. I really, it was very, um, very uh, fulfilling, this proof, um, because we just knocked our heads forever on there's a very different part of the proof than in standard stochastic gradient descent proofs, which is that for Adagrad, the um, step size at each iteration is a random variable that is correlated with the direction of the stochastic gradient. And so we cannot say that the expected value of one over bj plus one, or the step size, times the inner product between the true gradient direction and the stochastic gradient direction minus the true gradient direction is zero. We can't just pull the step size out and eliminate this sort of cross-correlation term, which is standard in stochastic gradient proofs, um, because the step size is a correlated random variable. So there were two things. One could instead consider a lagged adagrad, where you sort of lag your step size update to only depend on all the gradients up to the time before your current gradient, but then we don't get the log sum inequality. So that messes up things. So we can't really do that, or we couldn't figure out how to do that. So instead, we had to try to guess a good, uh, guess a value for the expected expectation of one over bj plus one condition on all the uh, random variables up to time j. What's a good guess of what it is an expectation? Well, it's close to one over the square root of bj squared plus, uh, say, a bound on the squared gradient, so cf squared. Um, so we can subtract that value, which is not a random variable after before conditioning, and then we have an expectation of two still dependent random variables, but uh, they're gonna be small enough that we can do some analysis tricks to show that this term is small enough that we don't ruin the convergence rate. Um, I know that I'm a little bit short on time, so now I'm gonna go straight to some numerical results for a situation I, that our theory does not cover, which is employing this Adagrad algorithm with stochastic gradient descent with Adagrad on neural network, deep neural networks. So now it's a different setting because neural networks are not smooth. And also, so we have training accuracy of, let me just tell you what this is, training accuracy in the top row. Um, so when training accuracy is 100, that means that we've reached a global minimum of the loss function, because that means that uh, our loss function is equal to zero. Uh, the red curve is the training accuracy of stochastic gradient descent with Adagrad after five epochs over the data, then after 20, then over after 60. Starting from the x-axis is the, the, the step size, the initial step size, b naught squared. So this is saying that the red curve, which is Adagrad, has pretty good convergence and that it goes to a high training accuracy after 60 epochs pretty robustly. It's pretty robust to choice of the initial step size, b naught. On the other hand, stochastic gradient descent with fixed step size, one over b naught, which is in black, um, you know, doesn't do anything if you start the step size too large, if the step size is too large. And if the step size is small, then it, it matches Adagrad. Stochastic gradient descent with one over square root j times b naught decreasing step size um, also does not do converge at all if the initial b naught is, is initialized too large. And it also doesn't do very well if, if you initialize it to be too small. So now what's not explained is that this shows that Adagrad converges not only to a stationary point, but to a global minimizer, and moreover, a global minimizer with good testing accuracy that has good generalization. Um, okay, so there seems to be, from this, there seems to be no reason not to use Adagrad um, on top of stochastic gradient descent. Um, 
It just has a wider bit, a wider range of um, step size initialization for which it converges uh, at a rate that matches the best rate for stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so this was over a CIFAR 10 data set with a, a ResNet 18 deep learning architecture, which is a very over-parameterized neural network, very over-parameterized, um, meaning there are many more uh, variables to optimize than uh, training data. So that's a very good situation. A not as good situation, we do the same experiment on ImageNet data set with a ResNet 50 a deep learning architecture, which is still over-parameterized, but not by very much. Um, and we have the similar plots. We see that Adagrad still seems to be at least as good as stochastic gradient descent in terms of how fast it converges, and it converges fast over a wider range of initialization. But it's not outperforming stochastic gradient descent as much in this example. Um, so it seems that over-parameterized neural networks, the more over-parameterized they are, um, the better, the bigger advantage we have uh, with these adaptive gradient, adaptive gradient methods. Um, so I could say, well, in the future, we'll have so much computing power that everything will be over-parameterized, so that's fine. Um, that's not really great. Um, but we have some additional results that I wasn't able to, to write up in time. What, what, what we showed in this talk was uh, like the first uh, theory for convergence of adaptive gradient method in the, set, in the stochastic setting um, uh, over functions which are smooth, not necessarily convex. And not only did we show that Adagrad algorithm will converge at a rate matching stochastic gradient descent, we showed it has this convergence but without having to set uh, to learn hyperparameters like the smoothness of the function or the stochastic noise in advance. So it's an on the fly, um, maybe you could say one pass algorithm, which is like the truly online setting, not the fake online setting of, of neural networks sort of. Uh, but the numerics show that Adagrad works beyond the setting that we proved the theory for. In particular, it, it works very well in the same way for neural net, for over-parameterized neural networks, which are optimization problems that are non-convex and non-smooth, in the sense that it is robust to the choice of the learning rate, and it also converges to not only a stationary point, but a global minimizer and, a very, and one with good generalization properties. Um, so we wanted to understand that, and so more recent work uh, with a, Zhao Jia and Simon Du, we analyzed Adagrad convergence and showed that a variant of Adagrad um, in the setting of a two-layer neural network with ReLU activation uh, does converge to a global minimizer um, of this class of non-convex, non-smooth <coughs> optimization problems that are um, close-ish close to, to what people optimize in practice. So that will be coming out next. More future directions. Improve the theory. Also, Adagrad is one adaptive learning rate algorithm. What's the best one? Um, what is the relationship of adaptive learning rate methods to batch normalization? I know that Sanjeev Arora has done some recent work uh, on this. And I, there should be more. Uh, Inspired by yours. Oh, cool. And uh, it's very interesting, and there should be more to do in that, in that direction. Um, and batch normalization really works. It, it, in practice, it really just stabilizes things. Just the automatic learning rate update is one advantage of batch norm. It has many other nice advantages. So here are some references. Thank you very much. That's it.
No. <laughs> I, I agree with what you said, that the auto-tuning is probably not, because other things have the auto-tuning property, like these Adigrad, Adigrad things and batch norm. Uh, so I don't know. Someone probably does know more than me. I haven't looked at this in half a year, and this field moves quickly. So sorry about that. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You do in practice, yeah. Yeah, and that has a nice property that it automatically normalizes the features. It does. Yes, I think that, you know, we, pub we, we put this paper up half a year ago or so, and I think since then someone extended it to the coordinate, coordinate wise version of Adagrad. I want to say that from the numerical experiments we did, um, in problems where the, the data is pre-processed so that the coordinates are all sort of of the same scale, the coordinate-wise version of Adagrad does worse than the norm version. It's sort of over, when I looked at these plots that I, that I, that I put up, the coordinate-wise version is not, not as good as the norm version. Yeah, yeah, but I think the theory has been proven. I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the authors, but it's there. Oh, yes. Yes. I like that uh, the, the method I presented is uh, sort of um, coordinate invariant. So if you take your function and just rotate it, then the norm update of the adgrad is the same. It doesn't depend on the, 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 the choice of coordinates. Yeah? Is that true? Yeah, yeah. It's, so one of the reasons, for example, that image people don't like Adam and Adgrad and so on so much is that they don't work on all samples. Uh, but for, say, sequence people, they have some trouble getting a sequence to work that Adam is really, really nice. Um, for sequence people? So, so say uh, RNN is much more sensitive to the rates than uh, Yes, that's a good point. So for recurrent neural networks, you often use Atom or Adigrad or something just to get any convergence at all, because the, the, the game is just to get some convergence, because they're so sensitive to the learning rate schedule that, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you have to say that like, implicit regularization results for something like Adigrad, like, do, they, do, do you get the same optimum as Yes, I, I haven't, so I haven't, we haven't done any experiments showing that our version of, not our version, but this norm version of Adigrad converging to something different than SGD. Now, if you look at the coordinate Adigrad, things are different. The coordinate-wise version change, changes your optimization problem, so it can converge to it. But this norm version, uh, there's no, I can't find any example where it converges to something different. Yeah, and I think that sort of makes sense. Um, well, I don't know if it makes sense. It needs to be proved. Thanks.